Hopefully the show's been going well for you. Uh, today we're talking about broadening your fleets, uh, connecting with exotic or different vehicles. Uh, basically, what do you do when it's not OBD? Uh, today we will be presented by Russell Cockerton, who actually flew in from the UK to meet with us today uh, and present. Jason Widla, who fronts a lot of our OEM initiatives, and myself, who manages the solutions engineering team. Thanks very much. So, exotic vehicles. Hopefully, when you saw the title and said, the question we're going to ask is, is, what do you think is an exotic vehicle? And when we ask that question, normally the response we get is those, the Aston Martins, the Bentleys, Porsches, those sorts of vehicles in the world. To Geotab, actually, those are actually not exotic. Those are really easy. Aston Martin, believe it or not, Ford and Mercedes-Benz. Bentley, Bugatti, Lamborghini, Porsche, that's VW. We have that covered really, really easy. Standard connectors, all exactly the same uh, engine protocols and data, very, very simple to support. So what are exotic vehicles from a telematics standpoint and from the Geotab standpoint? I'm going to give you a short list. We're going to go through some case studies throughout the presentation here. Yellow iron, so this is heavy equipment, um, excavators and your you know, bulldozers and stuff you would find on a construction site. Things with al alternative fuels. Um, electric vehicles and hybrids, that's a big up and coming space for us as well, especially with the re recent acquisition. Um, and also powered and off highway equipment as well. Yep. Geotab and ex exotics, more and more we're doing a lot of work. And a, and a big project that the in solutions, in, solutions Engineering and automotive teams have been working on, and a big focus for me in the past sort of year, year and a half, has been electric and hybrid vehicles. Within the last 18 months, we've added support for 50 different types of hybrid and electric vehicles. So we're covering almost 90% of current vehicles. We, globally, we have an installed base of around 5,000 units and counting. Um, and of those, 750 are um, pure EVs. Reseller of ours in the Netherlands um, has just recently won an award a contract to supply units into the Tesla taxi fleet, which runs at a Schiphol airport. Um, so they're going to be running Teslas against Tesla's own telematics um, in mm. the Netherlands and running into Sweden and, and Norway, which is interesting. It's worth pointing out, too, with the electric vehicle, um, although we are seeing a larger adoption in the U.S. and Canada, uh, in Europe, they're way ahead of the game when it comes to the adoption. So it's more important as we spread outside of thinking just USA, Canada, uh, there's a bigger need for some of these different types of vehicles. Um, and specifically, we're seeing a growing alternative fuel approach. Uh, CNG trucks are becoming popular, especially now that the fuel prices are going back up. We will see a, a, a call back to four years ago before the barrels dropped in price um, to CNG, LNG, and other alternatives being more common. And again, when we talk about these different vehicle types, the communication, the methods to be able to pull the data differs a bit sometimes. And as we also talk about that, we can't forget about our diesel friends. Uh, so the trucking industry uh, still is heavily weighted on diesel. But uh, we want to get deeper into the diesel uh, market, understand how to read the different levels, add blue levels, regeneration rates, uh, when, when the vehicle is being cleaned, and being able to help uh, ma maintain these vehicles for longer periods of time. Uh, because as we all know, as much as you try and as hard as you try, trying to make a dirty fuel clean isn't really a reality. So we try to do it as efficiently as possible, and by using the data, you can, you can support that. And aside from all the support built in from the engine data perspective, all the new upcoming changes that we have in the firmware to support the things like the you know, electric vehicles and the hybrid type diagnostics, we're seeing a big growth in the three-wire usage as well. So for all that equipment that doesn't have that standard diagnostic connection, we don't have a good way to actually get the engine information out. Um, we still have that fallback to use that three-wire harness, track the asset, get the engine hours, um, and still you know, have some meaningful info in information presented. And that's been actually really interesting in the last two years, where we're suddenly seeing a huge upsurge in, in people looking to, to track and monitor non-movable assets. And we're going to cover that in a minute, if it'll change. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so something we have to think about. Uh, the OEMs love making design changes to their vehicles. Uh, we talk a lot about plug and play, and the concept of this whole presentation is that as much as we try and as hard as we try, plug and play is not always a simple reality of getting universal harness and connecting it. Uh, Volvo Trucks, 2014, decided to change their standard 9-pin connector to an OBD port in some of their vehicles. 
creating a little bit of confusion because normally from a truck perspective, it's always been dominated by a 1939 9-pin connector. Of course, still connecting to the OBD had uh, a protocol that was, that was focused for truck. We had to adapt and change how we read from the OBD because it was a different environment. Um, in 2015, I believe it was, sorry, I don't have it up there, um, the truck manufacturers switched from a 250K frequency uh, communication method on their CAN buses to a 500, very standard with what OBD was. And at this point in time, it wasn't much of an issue from a perspective of reading the data, but they actually changed the physical port so that we needed to get a different connector to be able to connect to that. Um, and we're pointing this out because this is an ongoing change. We're already seeing that next year we'll probably start seeing a 14-pin connector in some of the Freightliner Packard vehicles, um, uh, even though it'll still have the same protocol. So we have to be aware and on top of it to understand that we have to see these changes that are happening. Yeah. Uh, another one I'll quickly bring up is the MX engines for PACR, where they decided to change the CAN network pins. So you might have heard Geotab talk about an adapter, which can allow us to connect to the CAN, um, CAN network. They moved. Um, and then we have vehicles that create multiple CAN lines. So we don't always rely just on two CAN lines that carry the, uh, hold the data. Uh, sometimes they can be on the port itself and just moved. Uh, sometimes we rely on a secondary CAN. And alternatively, sometimes we have CAN lines that are nowhere near the OBD, hidden in the vehicle. Uh, I'll talk about it a bit later, but uh, Japanese manufacturers are notorious for doing this. And we have to be aware of that if you want to be able to pull the data off of a vehicle. And today, we have a lot of new OEMs entering the market. We talk a lot about electric vehicles. And that's not limited just to cars, but we're talking about trucks as well. And what we're starting to see now is a lot of these manufacturers from outside of uh, Europe and, and Canada uh, trying to push their electric vehicles into the market. And they don't follow standard practice when it comes to OBD connection pin locations. So something else we have to be a little bit more aware of as we move forward into the market is what are the new manufacturers and the old manufacturers going to do to change that we have to adapt to and connect. Feature which gets spoken about a lot uh, is the FMS, fleet, mo a fleet management solution. Um, Prevalent, it was designed and um, put together by the five big truck manufacturers in Europe, Mercedes-Benz, Scania, uh, Volvo, Iveco, and DAF. Um, and the idea was because within trucks multiple CAN networks, what the, the FMS module is designed and intended to do is bring all of those networks together to a central point to allow a simple plug-and-play solution for telematics devices. Great and absolutely fantastic. Gives us a very, very good range of data, very simple install. The challenge is, <laughs> for truck owners, it's a, at least a 500 to 1,000 euro optional extra. So of course, most truck manufacturers and most purchasers go, uh, no. <laughs> we are seeing, and it's really interesting, we're seeing a lot of an increasing request for this from clients within Europe. We're also starting to see it in LATAM and a lot in, in Africa. And what's particularly interesting in Africa is that we're seeing that the trucks actually are supplied as standard with the FMS module, right? Which does make things a lot easier. Following that logic back into Europe, we're starting to see Mercedes-Benz and we're starting to see uh, MAN and even some of the Ivecos are fitting at a standard. When you go and plug it in, the unit's actually not active. So what they're doing is, obviously for their economies of scale, fitting it on the production line as standard. If you want to switch it on, then they charge you an admin fee. <laughs> of 500 euros to switch it on. Okay. Again, we do have the harnesses for it, easy to do, but if only it was that easy. Yeah. So kind of building on that, um, we know that Geotab prides ourselves on the open platform concept. So a single telematics device, you know, the Go device is pretty much the exact same as the Go rugged units, the same guts. Um, it really allows for the flexibility and, and for the ability for us to go into any type of application, go in, into any kind of market, adapt as quickly as we can when the OEMs surprise us with, with these changes year, year over year. Um, important to note that we do have harnesses. We've, we've come out with the universal 9-pin, the universal 16-pin um, as well. These are great. They're, they, they've helped uh, our reseller base. Our installers love them. They're not the end, the end of the line, though. There's always going to be cases where we have to come up with some unique um, you know, adapter or some unique harness to actually solve for cases where um, it's, it's non-standard. Building on that as well, the IOX expandability. So 
cases where we, we don't have engine data available, we can tie into sensors, you know, peripherals in the actual vehicle, start bringing in additional signals to enrich the data set, um, and really you know, get as much data as we can from that asset. Uh, this harness down here, some of you might have not seen it before, it's basically a pigtail you can hardwire to um, different can lines inside the vehicle. So that kind of ties back to, to Jordan's point, hidden can lines, non-standard connectors, that's again another strong point of flexibility for us. If I can interrupt really quick, and I forgot to remind everybody earlier, if you do have any questions, you can use the app to, uh, to put those in throughout the presentation. Sorry, I forgot to, to mention that earlier. Thank you. A couple of case studies quickly, um, and this is to give you an example of what we've done. Uh, yellow iron, um, off-road equipment, lots of names for it, yellow plant we talk about in Europe. Interesting application because most of the vehicles fortunately use either J1708, J1939, right? The challenge is, unlike road going machines, so cars and trucks and vans, yellow iron can easily last 10, 15, 20 years. And again, it's like anything. Yes, I can have a, a brand new 2018 Bell or whatever that is giving us great data. I can have next to it a 20 year old vehicle which looks absolutely identical, but we just don't get any data out of it, or the data is very limited. Um, a massive thing as well is hence go rugged, and we, we stress as much as we can in those applications, go rugged is your friend. Um, go rugged is specifically designed, designed to deal with the dirt problem, water, the excess vibration. Those vehicles by nature have a lot more vibration just on the nature of what they do, right? Um, we're also starting to see a lot more proprietary OBD connect or diagnostic connectors. So for example, CAT uses what looks like a standard nine pin Deutsch, exactly what we've got, except CAT being CAT, in their wisdom, switch the pins around. So mm. the t power and earth are reversed and the two can lines are reversed. You could, if you were in the field, you could hardwire that yourselves or we do have the CAT adapter. Uh, Komatsu is a nightmare because they have, they, you'll see a couple of pictures just now. <laughs> We're also starting to see OEM having security protocols built in. So from their point of view, yellow plant and, and earth moving machinery is, is a very stealable asset because you can't track it. There's, there's no VIN number often. There's no record of it. It doesn't have a license. Very stealable asset. So case, case in point was JCB. So JCB is a, a, a British brand. A lot of you will have heard of it, right? Um, their network, as soon as you when you start the machine, the, EC, the central ECU does a scan and it looks to look at it, see what's connected on the network. And each ECU is programmed to that particular vehicle. As soon as you plug anything else in, you get a, the vehicle will shut down and you get a siren going off because someone thinks you're stealing the vehicle. Okay? Fortunately, we have a solution. Right? We put the unit into listen-only mode, which is critical. So we're not doing any requests on, on the CAN lines. And thankfully, J1939, all of the data is actually broadcast. So you're still going to get your um, engine hours, your fuel levels, whatever the vehicle's going to tell you. Interesting case in this particular point, the uh, diagnostic port is built into the fuse box. So it's not removable. It's literally integrated into the fuse box. And the panel that covers it is literally two or three millimeters above it. So there's no ways we could plug a harness in. In this case, the installer, well done to the installer, and your installer is your best friend, created a, a little um, spacer box, which went over the top. Mm -hmm. So again, just one of those things that the innovation of, yes, we can solve this problem. Install installers are your friends. And stationary power powered equipment is actually very similar to the yellow iron environment. Now, we're not talking about equipment that people care too much about the GPS aspects, but they want to know how frequently is it being used, what are the engine hours that have been used over time, and then maybe some of the diagnostics come off of it. But of course, we run into the same problem. Non-standard communication ports, uh, they might be similarly to, similar to the Caterpillar. They might use the Caterpillar uh, if it's in that environment. Because it's important to note that once we start getting into this space, we start to see a lot of mix of the same engines being used in different types of equipment. So when we think Caterpillar, we think earth mover, we think bulldozer. Um, but it's not to say that it's not in a stationary equipment that uses a Caterpillar engine. It might even not be branded as a Caterpillar, but still use the Caterpillar engine. So this is what we have to start being aware of what's being used there. Um, but as such, we start running into the non-standard actual um, data communications. So this is where Geotab ourselves might have to look more into what data and how it communicates comes through to see if these are different parts that we can provide uh, support for. Alternatively, there are some situations where maybe a three-wire harness is necessary because in some cases these are mechanical engines. 
um, and you can't pull any engine data off because there's no electronic system to it to communicate that information. Um, so a three-wire connection still allows us to see the time that it's used, the basic data that we have, maybe accelerations if it's necessary, but not actually pulling it from an ECU in the environment. And similarly, install space. It can get very tight. We have a couple of examples mm -hmm. of pictures here, and I wouldn't be surprised if Russell himself is the one who went out to do some of these. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that picture on the left, interesting. That's a generator. It's a station. They put it on site with a forklift truck or what have you. That entire case is steel. It's literally two or three mil steel around it. GPS is a challenge. So mm. fortunately, it took a bit of engineering, and we climbed all over that thing to find it. <laughs> There's an inspection vent that was on the top of the, top of the um, equipment. And we actually had to run the go rugged to the top and put it there. We were fine. Again, installation challenges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the two down the bottom there, the one in the middle, that is a, um, a very English term. It's a lugger, small earth moving in a tripper, tr tripper truck. It does have J1939. Right? But it's got that weird little four pin Molex plug that we've managed to find, right? Using that eight wire harness that we've got, we managed to hardwire in, we have a data for you. And that's where it comes in with a lot of the connections. They might not have a proper port to connect to. Oftentimes nowadays, the uh, yellow iron and off road equipment and stationary are now creating their own connected services. Of course, this doesn't help us a lot because what fleet is not mixed? I'm sure a lot of people here know that when you're buying vehicles from a fleet, you never buy it from one OEM only. You get a mixed fleet. So it doesn't really help them much when they have to go to multiple different portals, get different types of data, and have no standardization between them. So what we do is exactly in that type of a situation, if there might not be a port, we might have to get creative. Use an 8-pin connector that actually allows us to have bare wire to be plugged in behind, maybe connect. Geotab will be uh, releasing something called a, a magic can in the future, which will help us connect uh, better into environments like this that are, are harder to, to connect to. And oftentimes, it's just a, it's an adventure of finding a can network, which are two wires, and a power ground to be able to power our device. If we can find those four wires, oftentimes, we can support the vehicle. Yep. And that's the name of the game. So uh, this brings us, you know, we talk a lot about US, Europe, Canada, even Latin America, but we start getting into some more interesting environments when we start talking about Asian vehicles. And this isn't just Asian vehicles in Asia. This is Jap Japanese manufacturers or Korean manufacturers who import the vehicles into the US. Specifically, um, we're very used to when it comes to truck manufacturers creating the nine pin connector. Everybody here knows this nine pin connector, correct? No, no mistaking it? Um, what's very interesting is when we started looking at Hino vehicles, Isuzu, Mitsubishi, they don't have them. They don't exist. The Japanese standardization protocols don't require a nine pin connector. They still have to follow protocol um, for the communication on the CAN bus, but you might not find that. So and oftentimes you will find an OBD connector. Now the challenge is here is that they like to hide their CAN lines. So you'll see an OBD connector maybe plug in and get no engine data or very limited engine data. And this is a bit of a game that's played. Um, that, those hidden can lines might exist somewhere else in the vehicle. We might have to go and explore and find it behind the glove box. We might have to go find it in the fuse panel. There'll be a small two-pin connector that you have to find that has that can network, yet the power is still being powered to the OBD. So these are environments that we have to be aware of and be prepared for. Um, as we start going to some of the other regions as well, when we talk about um, the, the uh, Asian regions like Southeast Asia and similarly in Latin America, we still see the K-line protocol. Uh, the K-Line protocol is an old, old ISO protocol which existed before the OBD protocol was created, uh, Euro 2 Standard Plus, um, and is very limited in data. Honestly, you al almost only see fuel data and coolant temperature. You might not be able to get VIN, there might not be odometer in existence, and this is a reality outside of the U.S. where this is still very common today. In the U.S., though, you'll still run into it if you look at vehicles that are early 2000s. Uh, Toyota, for example, still used the K-Line protocol then until 2004, I believe. So it's good to be aware of, of limitations of data as well. And even though the connection might be standard, we can't promise that the communication protocol of the vehicle is standard as well. So it's good to be aware of the capabilities there and um, know that even beyond ISO, even beyond 1939 and OBD, we run to proprietary CAN IDs. And this is an adventure that just happened recently. I went over to, to Indonesia to, to look at some of the vehicle data points that are coming off of these vehicles. Other than ISO, we started seeing a, a, a very common approach where OBD2 or ISO is not used in these standard passenger vehicles. Instead, they're all proprietary data. All their own CAN IDs, no protocol, protocol in existence. Um, if anybody knows this reference, there's, there's no data on mode one in the OBD. Instead, it's on mode 21 or mode 22. 
So just hidden in all these different spaces. So we have to be aware as a company that we are going to be running into some of these scenarios. And although it's not so common here, we're seeing it increasingly common, as mentioned earlier, in electric vehicles. Very similar approach where it's proprietary because there's no standardizations required for it. So as a company on our end, again, even though it's a standard connection point, we might have to do the effort and work to be able to support those vehicles. So sometimes the solution with some of these vehicles are specialty harnesses. Yep. Right? So when we talk about the Hino, when we talked about the Mitsubishi, Fu Mitsubishi Fuso, wow, that's a mouthful, <laughs> um, you'll actually have an OBD connector that has the two can lines come out of it, and those can then be plugged into the actual can lines that are hidden in the vehicle. If I can, so Kia and Hyundai are a very similar thing. Interesting in that in North America, Kia and Hyundai are relatively simple because the emissions requirements are slightly different. What we're seeing in Europe and in Africa is that, for example, Kia, Picanto, a couple of them, everything's on the OBD except for odometer. We have to go to a separate can line for odometer. Hmm. Honestly, yeah, that's been a nightmare <laughs> for me in the last couple of years or last year or so. We're starting to build it. We have the ability. Yeah. Just realize that sometimes we have to cut and paste slightly. Do, so, do we have any idea why they did that? Just it's <laughs> yeah. mystery. Your guess yeah. is as good as that. <laughs> yeah. We also see, interesting, both of those, uh, Kia and Hyundai, the VIN number of the vehicle is not programmed onto the ECU. So we get a lot of people saying, oh, I've plugged in the Geotab device, I'm getting my data, there's no VIN. What's wrong? What's well, not on the ECU, it's not programmed. Hmm. It's actually a situation I ran into last yeah. week, just in the US from the Hyundai Connected yeah. Equipment. It's just not there. Um, but to answer your question, the truth of the matter is, um, when we're talking about these vehicles, you know, we talk about exhaust, we talk about different countries and everything, but the Toyota Camry here might be very different from the Toyota Camry built somewhere else. Yep. So when we start looking at the make model year, we always think, oh, they're the same, it'll work the same. But when we start talking about uh, manufacturing location, it changes everything. A vehicle manufactured in Indonesia, manufactured in Thailand versus India versus Mexico versus US can all be different, mm -hmm. potentially. And that's the reason why they take different approaches, because the local manufacturer is the one who determines the approach that they want to take with these vehicles based around the standardization requirements of the country. Mm. And somewhere like Africa, it's not as strict as somewhere like US where the OBD2 protocol Euro 4 Plus was required. Mm. Thankfully, we're starting to see an adoption for Euro 4. And yes. sorry if I'm making terms that aren't well known, but that's you know, OBD standard oftentimes uh, is becoming a requirement. So in places like Asia and even Latin America, we're starting to see all the 2018s start following uh, in line more so with the US approach, which is making things easier for us. But what's the average age of a vehicle out in the, out in the world generally, right? 10 to 15 years. Yep. So even though the new vehicles are going to be equipped this way, we have to be prepared to equip to these older vehicles. We had, a, again, to a Toyota, Toyota Hilux pickups. What we saw happens that up until sort of mid-2016, we were getting very limited data. There was no odometer, no fuel. Suddenly in 2016, there was a facelift. They put a new generation engine in. Ray, we're getting literally everything. It was like <laughs> switch. It was Christmas. Coming back, the problem was that in Latin America, they have the new shape truck with the old generation engine. So mm -hmm. we, yay. <laughs> and, and the market gets kind of muddled too when we start talking about different countries. So again, we mentioned about manufacturing location, but I talk about Asia. We might be plugging into a vehicle that's got uh, a name you've never heard of before, imported from China, and you connect and you think, I'm never going to be able to work with this. It's actually just a reskin GM vehicle, mm -hmm. for example. We've seen this in Mexico a couple of times, in Ecuador. Similarly, well, you'll just get reskin Chinese vehicles over GM and then sometimes Mercedes, I want to say? Yep. NVW. NVW, right? So um, it's worthwhile uh, taking that approach. But oftentimes when you're faced with these challenges and you connect a vehicle and you're not getting data, uh, oftentimes it could be a challenge of maybe going to the vehicle, finding that hidden can line. Uh, Geotab is aware of how to do it. We look at voltage values and have done it historically. And we're trying, uh, as we might, and Russell's the best at this at our company, uh, putting together install documents to help out with some of these more exotic approaches to the, to the vehicles so that you're not left alone and confused mm. when you enter into a vehicle that just makes no sense to you. Especially when we start talking about the earth movers and the yellow iron, it's, it's something that we're trying to help out with. Yep. Electric and hybrid vehicles, that's a whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> so OBD, OBD and OBD2 was originally designed for emissions legislation. I need to be able to monitor how far have you driven, how much fuel have you used, and how much CO2 have you generated. That was the purpose of, of OBD2. Electric vehicles don't have that problem. So they don't actually have to comply with OBD in any shape, way or form. The bigger, the existing OEMs, the, the 
the Fords, the GMs of the world, because they have the networks and they have all the protocols in place, they actually do generally follow that protocol. Tesla doesn't have to. Tesla doesn't have an OBD port. We have that weird 16-pin connector, which is hidden behind the main um, screen in the, in the vehicle. We had to go and find that and build it. Uh, two years ago, Tesla, without telling anybody, even, even within Tesla, didn't tell anybody, they decided that actually they didn't like the 16-pin connector. They would start randomly using this 20-pin connector. <laughs> <laughs> there is no way of knowing. There's nothing in the VIN that will tell us which connector it is. The only way you know is when you open the vehicle, oh, I need the blue one or the black one. Sorry, the white one or the black one, right? We're having to build those harnesses for us. Okay? Also, multiple can lines. Again, the example of the Kia, uh, the Kia Nero and, and a couple of the new um, vehicles coming out. There is some information on the OBD port, but we're seeing the state of charge or the odometer or whatever it is on different can lines within the vehicle, and we're having to go and search for those, reverse engineer them, and find them. <sighs> non standard. <laughs> The challenge is they're making it up as they go. With OBD2, because of the emission standards, generally they follow the, the SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers guidelines, very simple to do. With electric stuff, they're making it up. So we're seeing even well-established OEMs having their own totally proprietary um, values and codes for state of charge, for charging status, for the engine data coming out. That's a big reverse engineering project for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. I think we're about to say the same thing. <laughs> so yeah. they'll, they'll be helping us out from that. But um, it, this, this also introduces a challenge I mentioned before about new OEMs coming into the market. Um, we have manufacturers, especially in the truck space, bless you, um, that gives us some challenges where because these aren't standardized, uh, SAE actually has guidelines for, oh, um, for electric vehicles, but nobody wants to follow it. So there's, there's a company that came out not too long ago in the US that make uh, mid-range trucks, and they decided, I'm going to make an approach here. I'm going to have three different CAN networks on my one OBD port. It's going to include a 250-1939 uh, network. It's going to have OBD and it's going to have proprietary codes, all separated in a confusing manner that makes no sense to anybody mm -hmm. except ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is the environment that we might have to be facing. It's not too different from when I was exploring a Chinese-branded uh, truck coming into the market that decided to switch pins around and then work off of non-standard 1939 messages, even though they could have overlapped with a lot of the standard messages. So we're starting to see a lot of these challenges come in. And um, I just thought I'd prepare you for that because mm -hmm. as we move forward, it's probably going to become more and more common. Mm -hmm. And Geotab's involvement might have to get a bit heavier on this front. Yeah. So tying in with that, engaging the solutions engineering team. So the three of us here mm -hmm. um, on that forefront. So we are you know, working closely with the internal automotive teams, you know, guiding the uh, actual development work and making sure that things get prioritized properly. We have the knowledge that, that you might need to, um, to get things done. Um, leveraging the relationship with the OEM. So, so many of them coming into this space, the electric vehicle space, doing their own thing. You know, it's kind of a big mess. Um, if we get in early enough, we might be able to guide them to use somewhat of a standard. So that's, that's sort of our goal is to maybe bring some sort of, um, you know, global standard that we might be able to actually... Uh, case in, case yeah. in point, and, and it was one of those, just at the right moment times, we, we were at a, a recent uh, vehicle show in, in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago. Uh, startup electric vehicle company, uh, one of the Chinese guys that started production in, in Coventry, came up to us and said, Geotab is exactly what I want, can you tell me? So we, we literally in front of them gave them the SAE J1939 document and said, you that, <laughs> which is fantastic. It also means we're in now with a new OEM, which is great. But yeah, yeah. exactly. But with your help, actually, that's, that's an easier approach because yeah. you're the ones who want this data. And it's actually a good place for us when we have a lot of these startup manufacturers because now we can start dictating how to better share this information yeah. versus the well-situated OEMs, which tend to, to focus it themselves. So, um, you know, get us in early to help out if necessary, mm. especially if it is involving an OEM. It happened to me recently about a couple of months ago, and we were able to actually make changes on their ECU yes. ahead of time before you know, we fell too deep and it became too much of a challenge. And then continuing the, the relationship with the OEMs, you know, that hoping to get better situated with them and get some information ahead of time when they're planning to make changes so that we're not hit blindsided when, you know, with new connectors and their newer models and stuff like that. So that relationship, um, you know, between Geotab and the OEMs is going to be very important in the coming years. Absolutely. Cool. Um, uh, sorry. That's all right. Yeah. 
think we're running low on time, actually. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, so another interesting space, ground service equipment. So might be found at airports or at um, you know, distribution centers and stuff like that. Very custom built, uh, something you would never see on road. Um, some examples here, so the stuff that actually buzzes it in and around the, the aircraft as it's getting ready to leave or, or land. It's my favorite to track. But. <laughs> this weird thing as well, yep. yep. Um, so custom built not only from a design standpoint, from, but also from the data standpoint as well. Limited engine data, we might get engine hours, maybe fault codes as well if, if it's um, a common engine that, that we have, are quite familiar with. Um, high security, so it's actually difficult to not only get access to these vehicles, um, you know, we, it takes a bit of time to, to prepare someone to go on site and actually get the access and, and um, you know, see the, see the asset. And then um, the Haslock consideration as well. So these vehicles or these assets operate in quite a dangerous um, environment. There's, there's people's lives at stakes. There's a whole bunch of other considerations from a regulation standpoint that need to be put in place. So when we start doing things like loose wiring and, and hooking into auxiliaries and stuff, um, there's going to be some specialized installation expertise that are going to be needed. So not only will we want a very good installer who's, who's familiar with this environment, but we also want to leverage perhaps the, the airport um, mechanics and staff as well. Um, so some of the solutions, I think I already mentioned it, but um, yeah, using the IOX NFC reader and the driver ID, so actually controlling who can start that asset if it's, if it's a specialized piece of equipment, we do have the capability to do that. Um, IOX-based signal monitoring, so something like fuel level, we could perhaps get a sensor put in, start reading the voltage through the IOX analog. Um, and then ignition detection based on accelerometer since RPM is not guaranteed, so it's a bit of a different environment again. We actually uh, have, have a guest here from, from Mexico right here, which can relate, relate to a lot of that, where using the IOXs and the sensors to connect to a vehicle that's otherwise dumb can actually be made to be a smart vehicle, get the fuel level, see if the doors are opening, see when the vehicle's moving, all of that. Uh, so it's interesting what you can do with these, uh, with these um, connections connected to these, uh, to these sensors to sort of smarten that vehicle up, even if we're talking about an old uh, 1980 vehicle. Extreme environments, and, and this is, is a personal project of mine, okay, who and laughed when I wanted to put it in, but the, in terms of the extreme of what can we do with Geotab, it doesn't get bigger than the Antarctic. The temperature range of, as you can see, down to minus 130 Fahrenheit, um, 24 hours of darkness for seven months of the year, there is no GSM connection, there's no cell phone networks there, uh, there's no maps, but a Google Earth, uh, very, very non-standard diagnostic connectors. Solution that we did here, right, was to use Geotab Go 7, oh, sorry, I like Go Rugged, sorry, Go <laughs> Rugged, with Iridium. So we have the Iridium modem, which is part of our standard portfolio. Um, as you saw, sorry, and I'm going backwards from the mapping, hmm. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it there, but not Geotab standard second by second tracking. Iridium works, we get a, a ping or a heartbeat every ignition on, ignition off at certain time frequencies. What we also did is built in for them a panic button, right? Um, so the problem is they've got all these engineers and, and research scientists to take a snowmobile, whatever it is, head off into the Antarctic and get lost. The panic button with Iridium will get a response. It'll give you date, time, location um, so they can respond. Middle of winter or even midsummer when it's a nice warm minus five. Um, <laughs> If you're out there and you get lost, you've got two minutes before you die. Mm. So very, very the rapid response is critical. What we also did for them was build that little four-button keypad. Very simple. It's part of our standard portfolio with an IOX auxiliary, the IOX aux. So the idea is that they're not traveling around. Um, and the, this particular project, they're monitoring a big ice shelf that's about to break away from the Antarctic. Uh, they can now press the button. So for example, button number one means oh, there's a crack in the ice but number two is, oh, there's a penguin, or whatever it is. Hmm. They can now put these blips on the map and create their own tracking portfolio. Yeah. We also integrated with their own GIS maps, because, yeah, scientists, and that's what they do. <laughs> great, great, great example, and fantastic people to deal with. It also means we're the first people in the world, first telematics company, to have all seven continents. Seven. Oh. Yay. <laughs> Uh, so just to wrap things up, uh, just make sure to do your homework whenever we're in these examples, right? 
if, if you have the questions and you want to engage with us, just please clearly define the situation, the customer needs, everything that you want so that we can better support you. Uh, naturally, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and always confirm make, model, year, and the VIN if you have it, if you have any questions. That helps us a lot because we have some information from that front. And uh, to be honest, Google is your friend. Where is the OBD port in this vehicle? Where can I find this? It could actually go a pretty long way if you're exploring a vehicle and you don't have an expert task right away. Mm. Don't forget to engage your partner account manager. So that's kind of your first helper. They, they probably have experience in that space, whatever you're dealing with. Um, they also have access to the internal resources, the solutions engineering team, the automotive team. So always keep them in the loop and, and you know, use them as your helper as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And installation is everything. Find yourself, make sure you've got a, a good JTAP, JTAP certified installer with experience. Um, as much as there are lots of installers out there, everybody claims to be an expert. And yeah, for a basic installation, JTAB is easy, right? I've taught my wife how to do an installation, because <laughs> I had to, right? When the more complex things, you need to know what you're doing. The faults that we see coming back, or when we've got weird data or things not working properly, probably 90% of those come back to installation. And that is literally, installation is everything. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, naturally, we have some time to ask some questions if you had anything. But hopefully, we helped describe the situations that are outside of your standard plug and play. It is a big factor of Geotab, but there are many situations that can occur, especially as we move forward and we start going outside of the standard passenger car and truck. Yeah, and remember, we, it's not limited to cars, vans, and trucks. We can almost, almost track anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, please. Yeah. How would that work? It's, it's a good question. So I mentioned before about how sometimes engines are used between vehicles, and I didn't actually mention Cummins. But Cummins engines are ones that are used pretty equally no matter what they're connected to. And although I personally wouldn't recommend boats just because there are no cell towers oftentimes near where the boats are, mm -hmm. um, the Cummins engines is a pretty common engine in the boats. Mm -hmm. And you can get all the standard information. Naturally, GPS and acceleration is, is standard no matter what. But we have people who have connected a rugged into boats mm -hmm. to be able to track them in the, uh, the diesel engine that's involved. Yeah. Volvo yeah. engines used as well. Yep. Or Absolutely. if it comes back to a three-wire install. So we did a, um, we've got a small case with one of the Sea Rescue Institute in, in the UK. Um, and we put it on the close shore yeah, right. res response vehicles, response boats. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you bring up natural disasters because during Hurricane Harvey, um, the Geotab product was using Red Cross trucks all across mm -hmm. to be able to help uh, monitor and find where they were moving and where people needed to go and to make sure that they're being more efficient with their routes uh, to help out with the rescue needs. I could actually see that being applied to boats in a flood situation, absolutely. Yeah. If, yeah. yeah, definitely if it's a first net approach, I would see that being more of a use case because uh, you get your special frequency, it's easier connection points, and you can almost bring those up anywhere, right? Like that frequency? Right. Yeah, absolutely. That would make sense to me. Oh. Sorry, everybody. Let's see if anybody asked us a question. <laughs> Do we have to log in? Did anybody ask a question? <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. please. Uh, is Iridium rugged enough to live in extreme weather conditions? So Iridium by itself, no. It does require, we, what we did with those particular modules is, is we found a, an IP67 rated box container, and everything was actually, um, okay. the, the, even the go rugged, we just put everything into a single IP67 box, secured it, put some padding around it to make it didn't want vibration. Um, and yeah, it worked fine. Uh, how is Geotab positioned on data compatibility with exotic vehicles in Asia and Europe versus competitors? Ah, that's a really good question, actually. So uh, I'll talk on Asia really, really quick. So Asia is kind of a better environment for us because there isn't too much competition in terms of actually being able to read off of the CAN bus. Um, depending on what country you're in, though, naturally. If we're talking about Japan, Korea, and um, Singapore, Things tend to be more standard, more like the, the Western world and the ways that the, the devices communicate. So I'd say the competition is a little bit more fierce, but limited in capability. We don't see a lot of uh, telematics products that have the capability and expansion of Geotab. And even in my experience in places like Japan, the leading uh, competitor only supports about half the vehicles that they connect to today. But if we start talking about Southeast Asia and China, we start getting into more, uh, more exotic vehicles, difficult uh, CAN uh, networks to connect to and we don't see much competition at all. 
Now, there is a, a large push lately from other companies into those markets. You know, we talk about places like China, naturally, India, two of the largest countries in the world with the most vehicles, including uh, somewhere like Indonesia, which I bet a lot of people don't, don't realize here that it's the fourth largest populated country in the world. It's gigantic. It's almost as big as the U.S., really. Um, are leading markets for this and, and starting to adopt the telematics front. Um, naturally, price is always going to be a bit of a challenge in some of these markets, but that's where value has to push. And that's where Geotab is ahead of the game in some of these markets. I will admit today, uh, maybe we're not the, the best just as a standalone, but this is why I mentioned I went to a trip recently to help it expand on our capabilities in the market. So I can tell you probably in the next three months, we'll be number one leader in terms of uh, supporting those vehicles and uh, won't see any competition in the, in the near future. Yeah. In terms of Europe, very, very, very well covered. It's actually, I, personally, it's not, a, not an official thing. I think we're probably one of the best supported telematic solutions in Europe, genuinely. It's not because I've done all the reverse engineering. We have <laughs> yeah. colleagues with us. <laughs> but we do. We, we cover every single, of, every single one of the ma uh, main manufacturers, 90% of the smaller ones. And we reverse engineer, realizing that the new stuff, the 2017, 2018 vehicles are actually quite easy. A lot of the work we've done is supporting those old stuff, the 2000, 2001. Uh, very, very well covered. Absolutely. How is the Go accelerometer working in the case of yellow iron machines? So it works fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the challenge comes back to my thing, installation is everything. You have to make sure when you, that Go rugged is, is secured, it's onto a good, strong, standard bracket, strapped down with no vibration. The challenge, if it's, it's either loose or you're putting it on a bracket that's shaking, mm -hmm. you are going to get weird acceleration stuff and you think you're going to have an accident the whole uh, time. On the point of vibration is that you can't stop the vehicle vibration yeah. naturally, but the Go Rugged is built to be able to prevent some of that vibration from creating noise that's unnecessary. So if you use a standard Go 7, you would see a lot of noise, mm -hmm. even if you connect it the same way, but the Rugged is built properly to help um, filter a lot of that out. Yeah. And again, you, you won't get the damage that would arise from the vibration because it's secured and it's built to yeah. deal with it. EVs don't need to follow OBD2, but what about hybrids? If yes, can hybrids remove the requirement at a later point? Is this also dependent on the country where the vehicle is manufactured? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's a pretty good question. So here, hybrid uh, rules need to follow the same emission standards because they're still using fuel. As long as there's fuel and gas being put in that vehicle, it has to follow the same uh, OBD standards. Yeah, and exactly the same in Europe. Yeah. Um, we are seeing a, a push, the bigger OEMs are... are even though they were doing proprietary, we're starting to see it come back towards OBD2 because it makes sense. Uh, who knows what's happening in the future? We've seen people change it on the day. Yeah. Uh, other countries, the, the <coughs> standards aren't as strict. Yeah. So uh, it's a little bit more lax. And that's why I mentioned in places like Asia, Latin America, even Africa, we don't see standardization being pushed as much. But lately, 2018 in a lot of places, starting to push some of these standards that we would consider older into these markets, so we're seeing them be the same. So they would follow the same rules. As long as gasoline is being put into that vehicle, it has a standard requirement. Uh, what should be our best way to approach an exotic vehicle step by step, and presumably from a reseller? That's standpoint? a great question. Yeah, you're, you probably have the most experience here. <laughs> <laughs> First thing to do is, is we, do have, we do have a lot of resources online, right? We'll be able to go and find documentation. Is, do we have it? Is it supported? Second step would be, you're going to have to engage your, oh, well, no, it's a bit, engage your um, account manager. Right? When you talk to them, though, what we need from you is as much information as you can about the vehicle. Make, model, VIN, anything that you can find. As you saw it earlier on, was Google is your friend. So even if you're not sure, do a quick search online. Where is the OBD port in a BYD whatever vehicle? The question that comes to your account manager will either go to support they might be able to answer directly, or it'll come to us and we will respond with whatever information we can get to you. Um, and I just brought up the, the Harness Cheat yeah. Sheet. We try to help as well, where we have a sheet that you can look at, see if some of the exotic vehicles are there. You know, I mentioned the uh, Mitsubishi Fuso, the Hino. These are on this list for specialty harnesses that are required and how to install. And as we move forward, we're going to be creating more uh, specialized installation documents where appropriate to be able to share that with the, with the teams uh, to be able to see those as well, to give you more of a step-by-step -step approach. Um, but normally, uh, in a lot of these cases, the first step always is find that port, plug in the device. Naturally, that's the best way. See what data is flowing through. Because in most cases, even if it feels like it might be exotic, you might be surprised. 
right? You know, we mentioned the Aston Martin and things like that. Mm -hmm. We can share this with you. It is it is searchable on, on Google. <laughs> we have a, uh, currently an EU and LATAM um, register, and we've literally, by year, make, and model, you're able to search through it and see, you know, where is it? Uh, what generation is it? What is the what is the VIN format look like? Um, can we use a T harness? What harness do we need to use? And where possible, we're starting to build the install guides as to how do you install. And of course, now I'm not going to be able to search one. Here's one. So the US is easier and it works off of a cheat sheet because naturally it's, it's a little bit more standardized. That's why there's a specific sheet like this for places like Europe and Latin America where it does get more complicated. And it is worth pointing out that definitely the further you get away from US and Canada, the more complicated it gets. It's not going to open, but there. Yeah, this is a project for me. How to install, take those panels off, unclip that, plug it in. Yeah, we're starting to build those for you. And we can if you have Part of what we do is when we get a complex vehicle or a new vehicle with particular challenges with multiple can lines and that, we build that document for you so that when your installer gets on site, he's got this step-by-step -step documentation of what to do and where to go. Okay. Yep. Any others? Uh, yeah. Uh, some partners like Mobileye have a library feeded by certified installers where they can log how installation details and data points are available per type of vehicle. Is that on Geotab's roadmap? So today, I can't say it's on Geotab's roadmap. Uh, it is worth pointing out that although Mobileye does offer that up, it tends to be for more standard approaches to vehicles. Um, I've personally seen it myself that when we start getting to some of these vehicles, it's not quite so standard as we pointed out this entire time. Um, it is a good idea, and I know Geotab has floated around historically, and potentially maybe afterwards when we start getting comfortable with our certified installers, seeing about doing some steps with uh, can sniffing. But um, we, we have to make sure because it, it, it gives um, sometimes some uh, false hope to what can be done in a vehicle because as I mentioned maybe the CAN network doesn't even exist on the OBD It might exist somewhere else completely So, you know, we also don't want to set the stage for somebody thinking oh I can just get the data myself and then put in geotab also from my prioritization por point of view if protocols completely shift and they completely change Doing a CAN sniff and getting the information doesn't mean that it'll be an automatic application to our firmware There might be effort and work because we live in an environment where we have one device that can fit in any vehicle we don't have to preset anything. It could be unplugged and plugged in somewhere else, whereas Mobileye is preset to a vehicle ahead of time. So it's a bit easier to work around that environment. This register, we've, we've put in the, what we call the top five. So what do we normally expect from a vehicle? So VIN, ODO, uh, fuel, fault codes. And that's populated as well. And, yep. yeah. uh, are there pros and cons for Go Rugged versus 3Wire? So I wouldn't call those mutually exclusive. No. So Go Rugged can be a three-wire install. Um, the the three-wire install basically refers to which harness are you going to use. Is there a CAN of it or a CAN data available? Are you going to go to a CAN network? Yeah. So would you be able to use either the nine-pin or the sixteen-pin harnesses, or do we use the eight-pin pigtail? Where there's not, where there is no data, or where the data is totally proprietary, that's when you're going to go with three-wire because it's going to be literally power ground ignition. Yeah. Power, ground, and then align to the ignition specifically to figure out what the vehicle's on. So hopefully that helps describe it. But we have a direct connection to 3Wire for the rugged and also the Go 7 8. Yep. Uh, for Asian vehicles, can 3Wire be used, and would that avoid having to know where the OBD port is located? Yep. Absolutely. In fact, there's no vehicle that as long as there's a 12, uh, 24, and occasionally a 36 volt battery, you can connect directly to that and have it work for, for the system. And, and it is a workaround oftentimes, and as mentioned, this is where you might start using the auxiliaries to pick up the other data mm -hmm. points, maybe get an outside fuel sensor, connect the analog to it, and then you can see the <laughs> fuel level as well. Fuel theft is a major issue when we talk a lot about Southeast Asian countries, so it becomes a necessity to connect these. East Europe is probably somewhat similar. Africa and Latin America is also very important to prevent fuel theft. That's all the questions. Excellent. Thank you. Anything everybody. anybody want to ask really quick? No, it's, defi it's definitely a good question. It's actually sort of a combination answer where everything you said is a yes, uh, but it depends on your approach, right? So number one, when we talk about European and Japanese companies, they are the biggest uh, uh, focus uh, companies on saying, don't touch the OBD if you're not us. Oftentimes, it's about control of that OBD. You want you going back to their dealerships. They don't want people to be able to repair the vehicle themselves. 
information like that. Now, the big buzzword for them is security, and that's a big issue. But we started to see an openness to the adoption of it because you're fighting the need of the industry. Uh, when we talk about consumer focus, they'll never really open up much to a company like us because there's no need. You have the inf to infotainment system, which is connected. You need limited data. But when we talk fleet, they're starting to open up and adopt. Uh, so you've probably seen the press release recently where Ford is, is working with Geotab and has adopted that into their system. Um, Volvo Trucks has adopted it and, and helped support the, the device in being sold into the market. We're seeing some more adoptions from some of the other countries. Uh, Mercedes-Benz in Mexico is selling the product. So to answer your question, they're starting to open up a bit uh, because there's a big backlash too when they would say that we control your data to the consumer. And this has become a problem in the day and age of privacy, the Facebook scandals and everything that's coming up. So they've become more open. And what's going to happen uh, moving forward is, and I think you probably heard a lot of people talk about this yesterday, is um, they will be focusing on their own in, in integrated hardware, but open up those APIs for companies like Geotab and yourselves to be able to feed that through and still offer services. That will be the long-term goal, but in the interim, because of mixed fleets and such, they still have to look towards a product like ours. Hopefully that helped answer. But as I mentioned, it is pretty much a yes to everything. But I think the proof is in the pudding with a lot of the press releases you've been seeing with Geotab and the OEMs directly. And Jason can, you know, on the side, if you want to talk to him about it, he, he's the one who talks directly to a lot of these OEMs to create partnerships. Yep. Anything else? Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.